Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. So in our conversation for lecture 20, uh, we're naturally going to continue what we were talking about in lecture 19, which just as a reminder, at the very end of lecture 19, the very last video, we proved that um, a polynomial ring whose coefficients come from a field always forms a Euclidean domain. Therefore, there is a Euclidean norm, uh, and we claimed that this is the division algorithm, but it's somewhat suspicious to call the Euclidean norm the Euclid or the division algorithm if we don't have an algorithm, right? There should be a process, there should be steps by, that we should take. But in the proof, uh, in the proof where we prove that um, a polynomial ring over a field is in fact a Euclidean domain, we actually were able to construct uh, the quotient and remainder recursively. And this is in fact the division algorithm that we know from um, previous college classes like uh, college algebra is a setting where I would teach students about polynomial division, math 1050. Uh, it also comes up in maybe intermediate algebra, math 1010, or high school algebra, or whatever. But the algorithm that we use um, in these classes, such as math 1050, is exactly the algorithm that was embedded inside of the proof uh, that a polynomial ring over a field is in fact a Euclidean domain. So let's let's talk about let's let's be explicit about the algorithm now instead of more of the proofy approach to it, right? Uh, let's take two polynomials, f and g, which belong to our polynomial ring f adjoined x there, where again, f is a field. And let's suppose that g is not the zero polynomial, otherwise we really couldn't divide by it. And so then we proved that given f and g, there exist unique polynomials q and r uh, that satisfy this equation, f of x equals q of x times g of x plus r of x, and r is either the zero polynomial or it has a polynomial degree strictly less than g. And so I should perhaps amend what I said earlier. When we prove that f of x here is, in fact, a Euclidean domain, we didn't construct the Euclidean norm. We argue that the degree function was the Euclidean norm and that setting. And the process of doing so, we recursively were able to construct uh, these polynomials Q and R. So let's be explicit in this example here. So what I want us to do um, is we're just going to use the setting. Uh, we're going to use the setting of, well, basically the rational number. So Q adjoin X, like so. Uh, this would be a Euclidean domain by what we've seen before. We have uh, the Euclidean algorithm, but the division algorithm, of course, what we're focused on right here. And just to make life easier, I'm actually just going to assume that my coefficients are actually um, just integers in this situation, because we will see by the end of this video that factorizations of polynomials over the integers are actually the same thing as factorization of polynomials over the rational numbers. But for the moment, B, in this video, we'll assume these are rational polynomials, because they are. And so take the polynomial 6x squared minus 26x plus 12, and we're going to divide it by the polynomial x minus 4. And so the process that we developed in the proof was the, was the following. I'm just going to look at the leading, the leading terms for a moment, right? And I'm going to ask myself, how many times does the leading term of the divisor divide into the leading term of the dividend in this situation? And in this situation, well, I mean, x is going to go into x squared x many times, and then the coefficient here is 1, so that makes it a lot easier. So 6 divided by 1 is going to be 6. And so we can do that calculation. 6 squared over, uh, excuse me, 6x squared over x is equal to 6x, like so. We then record that number on the top of our, of our bar right here. Okay? That was, the, that was the quantity we computed generally in our in our theorem there. And so what we did is we then took this number and we times the divisor by this uh, partial quotient we have right here. 6x times x minus 4 is going to give you 6x squared minus the 24x like so. So we can we can write it like this. So we have this 6x squared minus 24x. That's just 6x times x minus 4. Uh, but then we took that quantity and we subtracted it from the polynomial. Uh, so we took, so again, this right here is just the 6x times x minus 4. We subtracted it from the polynomial above. 
So if I distribute that negative sign, we end up with six, negative six X squared plus 24 X. Um, in this situation, because we chose this number perfectly, these leading terms are gonna cancel out. Six X squared minus six X squared gives you zero X squared, it's gone. Um, then we also have to consider negative 26 X plus 24 X, that's gonna give us a negative two X. And then we'll just bring down the, the any other terms that are left. And so now the dividend has been reduced to a degree of, to a polynomial of strictly smaller degree. And this is then where the algorithm recurses itself. We then consider dividing this dividend by x minus four. The process repeats itself. How many times does x divide into negative two x, for which we get negative two x over x, that's just gonna be negative two. We record that number up here. We then are gonna take that number negative two and times it by uh, times it by x minus four. That's gonna give us negative two x plus four, but we're subtracting this, excuse me, uh, plus eight, two times four. Uh, but we're just gonna subtract this from above. So if you subtract this, it becomes a positive two x minus eight, like so. And then combining like terms, the leading terms cancel out again. You have a 12 minus eight, which leaves you a four. And this is now gonna give you the remainder here because notice four as a constant polynomial has a degree strictly smaller than X, uh, which in this case, it's a linear polynomial, its degree is one. So that means the division algorithm does in fact terminate in this situation. And so therefore we end up with the following, we have actually the formula we were looking for, f of x, which was six x squared minus 26 x plus 12, it factors as the quotient q of x, which is six x minus two, times the original divisor x minus four, plus the remainder four. And so just like we had promised, uh, the fact that the polynomial ring f adjoint x is a Euclidean domain does in fact give us this division algorithm. And like I said before, I was doing this over the ring Q adjoint X, but as we went through this entire process, we never actually used any fractions. It really was done inside of Z. So is Z adjoint X, is it a Euclidean domain? And the answer of course is no, it's not, um, because as we also know about Euclidean domains, Euclidean domains are principal ideal domains, and Z adjoint X is not a principal ideal domain. Uh, one example to see, of course, is if you take two and X, uh, this is an ideal, so the ideal generated by two and X, this is an ideal in the ring Z adjoint X, but there is no single element that generates that entire thing. So it's not a principal ideal domain, so it can't be a Euclidean domain, but nonetheless, we can do division in this setting. Uh, why is that? Well, because honestly, when you do polynomial division, you might have to exit, perhaps, to the rational numbers. Maybe you have to divide. But maybe you can fix that, maybe not. It turns out that division, of course, is related to factorization, and factorization over the integers is very similar to factorization over the rationals. Of course, I'm talking about the polynomial ring and not the rings Z and Q themselves. And this is what we're going to explore later on in this lecture. Um, but what I want to do first before I switch the slide here is I also, also want to remind the viewer about this notion of synthetic division. Uh, synthetic division is a trick that is commonly used in a setting like Math 1050 College Algebra to help us factor larger degree polynomials. Um, and synthetic division works in the following manner. What you do is you take your dividend and you write down all of its coefficients in descending order. So we'd say 6 minus 26 plus 12. Uh, and we don't need to put the plus, we'll just put 12, like so. And if there was any um, terms that were missing, uh, you would put in a zero for placeholder. So it is important that you have this x squared spot, uh, this x spot, and this constant spot over here. All of those are necessary. Uh, you're gonna separate that with the bar, you're gonna draw another line here, and then you're gonna record the number four up here. So you're dividing by x minus four, and so you just record the four right here. The synthetic division only is applicable when your divisor has the form x minus something. Um, you record that number here. Now the algorithm that we take into place here is you're going to, whenever you see two numbers in, in, a, in a column, you add them together, which in this case is there's nothing down here, you're actually just adding a zero. That's how you initialize this. Six plus zero is, is just six. Then you're gonna take numbers on the bottom row and times it by this number right here. So four times six is 24 negative 20, so then you add these together, negative 26 plus 24 is negative two. You're gonna take negative two times four to give us a negative eight, and then you're gonna take 12 minus eight, and that's gonna give you four. 
And this last number, I'm going to delineate it because it's the remainder. And then this right here gives us the quotient if we put back in the um, if we put back in the variables x. So we get 6x minus 2. Um, and then we get that this is the quotient, and then we have a remainder of four. So synthetic division can actually uh, go through this process very, very quickly, a lot faster when your denominator is x minus a number c. Um, why does it even work though? I want you to, before I erase too much, right? I want you to see these numbers look strikingly similar, right? Um, notice what we had here. We ended up with, of course, the six right here, the 24, the negative two. Really, I should write it more like this. We had this, whoops. Sorry about that, my four got deleted. Uh, we have a six right here, a 24, a negative two, a negative eight, and then a four, right? We were able to predict all these numbers. I forgot to mention the 12 as well. We could predict all these numbers and why does that work? So I'm going to empty my tableau this time and think of the following. Okay, since the leading term here is just x, remember this has to have the form x minus a constant. Since your first term is an x, how many times is it going to go into the leading term? Um, well, it's going to go on that. You're going to reduce the power of x by 1, and then you're going to have the exact same coefficient. So we just drop down the coefficient we started with. Then you're going to take this 6x right here, uh, 6 times some power of x. You're going to times this by that. You're going to get 6x times, excuse me, 6 times some power of x times x. That'll cancel out with the leading terms here. But then you're going to end up with this number, which in our case is 4. You're going to times it by the coefficient here, 6. This is where the 24 comes from. Notice you have a 24, but shouldn't it be negative, right? Negative 4 times neg uh, positive 6x here. Oh, remember, you're subtracting it, right? So yes, 6x times x minus 4 does, in fact, give you 6x squared minus 24x. But since you're subtracting it from above, when you distribute that negative sign, you end up with these terms canceling out. But then this becomes a positive uh, 24, which is what we saw right here. You're then going to add these numbers together because you're combining like terms. Negative 26x plus 24x ends up with the negative 2x, which is when we add these together, you end up with the negative 2. We just aren't writing the powers of x because uh, it's OK, but we get that negative 2. So then we repeat this process. How many times does x divide into negative 2x? And this x could be any power of x, potentially. Well, because again, this is a monic divisor, the leading coefficient's one, um, all that's gonna happen is that the power of x will reduce by one, but the coefficient is gonna carry up here. Again, you might have some uh, power of x, but it'll just be smaller. The coefficient's gonna be the same. And so when you take negative two times x minus four, this will give you the positive two because we're subtracting it, it cancels out the leading terms. But what happens to the other term? You're gonna take a negative four times a negative two, which gives you a positive eight, but you subtract it. So we end up with this negative eight right here. Notice that negative eight is just four times negative two. You end up with negative eight like so. And then we have to add these together. You end up with a four. And this process will continue to repeat itself until you've exhausted everything. And so synthetic division really is just capturing all of the information from long division. And this can be very, very useful, of course, when you're trying to divide by a linear factor of the form x minus 4. Um, we were doing this over the rational numbers, the rational field, but I want you to be aware that this makes sense for any, any polynomial ring with, a, with field coefficients. Because we can divide the scalars, we can divide the coefficients, we can divide these polynomials using this division algorithm. And we can always get our polynomial is equal to the divisor times a quotient plus a remainder. Um, and then synthetic division also applies in the setting where um, you have x minus c of some kind. The algorithm is not going to change. Now, the arithmetic could change. Don't get me wrong, right? Um, what, what does it mean to add two numbers together? What does it mean to multiply two numbers together? That's a very curious thing, of course. Uh, and so that's that's what one has to investigate in this situation. I also want to mention that synthetic division, of course, makes sense in any, any um, ring because, well, I should say any polynomial ring where the coefficients are somewhat, you know, irrelevant because when it comes to synthetic division, you add and you multiply, um, which every ring can do that. So whenever you're dividing by x minus four, uh, excuse me, x minus c, you can use synthetic division. With When it comes, to, of course, to long division, you might need to actually have fractions. But again, in a field, that's a non-issue. So why am I talking so much about division and particularly synthetic division? What's the, what's the dealio? Well, 
I want to remind us about a very important result that a student often sees in a class like College Algebra Math 1050. And I want to convince us that this result is actually a general theorem of polynomial rings, where again, F is a field. And so this is known as the remainder theorem. If F is a field and little f is a polynomial in the polynomial ring F of joint X, then if F of X is divided by X minus C, then the remainder F of C is actually the evaluation of the polynomial F of X at the number C itself. And so let's look at this to see how that happens. So this polynomial F of X with regard to the divisor X minus C, uh, the division algorithm applies because we do have this Euclidean domain here. And so therefore there exists polynomials, uh, unique polynomials Q of X and R of X such that F of X equals X minus C times Q of X plus R of X here. Now, as the divisor is X minus C, the, the remainder here has to either be zero or it has to have degrees smaller than the divisor X minus C. But the divisor is a linear polynomial, so the only thing smaller in degree would be degree zero. That is, it has to be a constant polynomial. The zero polynomial, of course, is also a constant polynomial. So because R of X is a constant polynomial, we really can just call it a number. And we'll just call it R and not think of it as a polynomial anymore. And then I want us to consider what happens when we evaluate this function at X equals C. So at F of C here, we end up with C minus C times Q of C plus R. Since R is constant, it doesn't depend on the C there. Um, now, of course, C minus C is zero. And you know, regardless of what Q of C turns out to be, zero times Q of C is equal to zero. And so zero plus R will give you R. And so this remainder theorem is a very critical, important thing. F of C is just going to equal R. And we did this over a polynomial ring with field coefficients, but does this have to be field coefficients? Well, we just need to have a setting where this can happen, where F, where there exists polynomials Q of X and R of X such that this happens, um, which that does happen over Z of X as well. Um, and this mostly has to do with the fact that it can be extended to its field of fractions like so. And so this remainder theorem has broad reaching scope. And so if you want to evaluate a polynomial, let's take the polynomial we saw a moment ago, right? Let's take f of x is equal to, um, where did it go? It was 20, uh, excuse me, 6x squared minus 26x uh, plus 12. And so when we evaluate it at the number 4, you're going to end up with 6 times 4 squared minus 26 times 4 plus 12, uh, work through this thing here. Uh, we're gonna end up with four squared, um, and of course is 16. So we get six times 16. Over here we have 26 times four. If you don't know that off the top of your head, the nice thing about multiplication by four is you just double it twice, right? So if you double 26, you end up with 52 times two plus 12 right there. Um, here, what's gonna happen here is three times uh, 3 times 16 is 48, so you get 2 times 48. Uh, so then if we double that, we end up with 96. And then we're going to subtract from that. We then have to take 52 times 2, which is 104 plus 12. Continuing on with this thing here, 96 take away 104. That is going to give us negative 8 plus 12. That ends up with a positive 4 like so. All right. Now that calculation wasn't too brutal, but you know I didn't even use a calculator. Amazing, right? Uh, but you can see that with the with the exponents and such, you know, this thing potentially get quite nasty if you have a much larger degree polynomial. But remember the synthetic division. Okay, six, negative twenty six, twelve. You divide by four here. Well, by synthetic division, you bring down the six. Four times six is twenty four. Minus twenty six is negative two times eight is negative eight plus 12 is four. And this is an evident, this is evidence of the remainder theorem, right? The evaluation is equal to the remainder of the polynomial divide by X minus four. For which when you look at synthetic division, I think most of us would agree that actually the synthetic division, you never have to do with that, deal with exponents whatsoever. It's just add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply over and over and over and over again, right? And even the products never really got that big in comparison, right? You know, we had like a 96 over here and a 104 over here. But over here, the biggest biggest number we ever had was negative 26, which was one of the coefficients. Uh, the remainder theorem does allow for us to 
uh, much more efficiently compute evaluations of polynomials using division. And this just is the first of many applications we're going to see of the remainder theorem. Uh, the factor theorem being a big one, which we'll talk about in the next video.